How the writers of the Bible saw the world. It's important to understand what we as a race of human beings were like before the dawn of the scientific age. This is not exactly the, actually the best way to pose this question because we've always been scientific. We've always sought to understand the world around us and organize our observations into coherent theories. The difference between then and now is that the emphasis is on what we can perceive with our physical senses and less on what we know intuitively or can come up with creatively. The challenge today is to strive for a balance between these two worldviews. There's a lot of evidence that ancient civilizations had more knowledge of the way the world works than scientists today are willing to acknowledge. The pyramids of Egypt are a good example. Engineers are puzzled by the degree of accuracy with which the pyramids were built, accuracy that would be hard to duplicate even with today's technology. The ancient Egyptians did not have GPS, and yet the pyramids are laid out as if they did. Since the Egyptians did not have the tools we have today, how is it that they were able to, to achieve such results? Laying aside for the moment all of the popular theories about their methods, we want to acknowledge that though their worldview is different, the spirit they brought to their endeavors was identical to the spirit we bring to our best achievements today. Little has changed in this regard. The human spirit and desire for understanding and articulating our knowledge is the same now as it was then, but the way they organized what they knew is different. They had a different way of expressing it. In our current philosophical framework, it's, it's very important to separate what we know from what we believe. Our rational and intuitive faculties are kept strictly apart. But for the ancients, science and religion were one and the same. The split had not yet taken place. And it's easy for us to jump to the conclusion that because they were the same, that there was no science. This mistaken assumption is the main stumbling block to understanding the Bible. The scientific part of our nature has always recognized that the world operates according to principles. We talk of them now in terms of the laws of thermodynamics and more recently in terms of quantum physics. And we're able to discuss, uh, to distinguish among the different laws because of the way we use the language. But the ancients called these principles gods and were able to, to distinguish them by giving them different names and attributes. The stories of the gods were symbolic representations of how the principles they represented interacted with one another. Without the scientific language we have today, stories were the only form they could use. And just as understanding science requires advanced degrees from specialized universities, for those in the ancient world, understanding the symbolic meanings of the stories required elaborate stages of, in, of initiation. Don't make the mistake of thinking that what the ancients were up to was merely science as we understand it to be only in its infancy. Nothing could be farther from the truth. What we need to admit to ourselves as a race is that our intuitive faculties are in a state of extreme atrophy, but in the ancients, they were in full career. What our compromised intuition allows for is a misconception of the world as a machine a mechanism devoid of consciousness and intelligence. We've lost the ability to sense life as a living energy, but the ancients knew that the world is alive and the best way they could describe what they saw was to put it into story form. Unless you can see the world through their eyes, you will not be able to understand the Bible. So an easy way to learn the Bible. I'm not a Bible scholar. I don't have a Bible quote for every occasion. In fact, the quotes I have memorized could fit, all fit on the back of a business card. And I like it that way. Why? Because every time someone throws a Bible quote at me, it feels like a brick. Not in terms of its impact, I'm pretty immune to them by now, but in the sense that a brick is an undifferentiated mass. If you break a brick in half, there's no insight inside of it. It's just more brick. 
And Bible quotes, especially when hurled, don't illuminate the actual teachings. They just turn them into bricks. <laughs> While I can't quote the Bible verbatim, I do feel like I get the gist of what it has to say. And if I had to choose whether to get, whether to get the gist or be able to recite numerous passages by heart, well, I'd choose the gist every time. Because it's one thing to know what a book says and another to understand what it says. Understanding beats memorization any day of the week. There is a simple way to learn the Bible, not just what it says, but what it means. But first, let's be clear about meaning. You cannot know what a thing means until you know what it means to you. This might sound obvious, but it really isn't, not when it comes to learning the Bible. So many people have, in, have interpreted scripture that the interpretations have taken over, and most Bible study programs start with the interpretations. Why is this bad? Because it denies you the opportunity to form your own opinion, to make your own associations, to relate what the Bible says to what you already know about life. In other words, you have to start from where you are, not from someone else's point of view. For example, if you take the saying, turn the other cheek, what in your life, your life, can you relate that to? What experience have you had where this teaching of Jesus could apply? There's probably an incident bubbling up right now, right? How did you handle the situation? Did you react or did you consider your options? Does the incident linger as a moment of cowardice or a moment of, moment of shame? Can you take Jesus' Jesus's saying and sit with it, let it sink in? How does it apply to what happened to you? You see, this is what it takes to study the Bible. You have to think about it, not with your intellect necessarily, but also with your gut. Thinking is not easy. It's far easier to just memorize and not just thinking about something, but to reflect on it. How does it apply in my life? This is a form of meditation, sitting with an idea as though it were a living presence, like another person sitting in the room with you. Very few words, but lots of sensing, lots of being with. What does it say to you? What does it evoke? What other sayings can you think of? How about I and my father are one? Is there a place in you that can say this as Jesus said it with knowing and legitimacy? Does it only apply to Jesus as the Bible scholars would have you believe? Was this a historical statement or was it a universal truth? If you sit with these words as I have described and take them just as they are without interpretation, what happens? What inner reality do they evoke? Can you enter into the reality of what the words say? If you do this, you will see that the teachings of the Bible perform a kind of alchemical function. They are designed not to inform, but to transform. The teachings of the Bible are the bread of life, not a philosophy. You don't need to get it with your head, but once you get it in your gut, your head will catch up. Right. That's like uh, doing the Bible interpretation where reading a chapter and then writing down what you think it means and then writing down what it means to you. Yes. So that you really get, you get it inside you. It, it's a great way to learn the Bible. The effects that that exercise has is that it teaches us to distinguish what is and what we think <laughs> is. Because it really does speak, it does speak to you. Oh, you yeah. Know, it, it, it impresses upon you or us, me, what it means so that it becomes a living word. It really does. Yes. I recall when in teaching Bible classes when we were in the order, um, when we would have students, we'd all sit around with a King James version and we would do one verse at a time. And then we'd have the person... Uh, talk about that and say, well, what do you think it means? And then talk about that one verse. Yeah. And then we would, uh, if there was um, 
non-understanding of the word, we would pull out, a, we'd always have a dictionary sitting there. So we would have a common understanding of the word or where it came from. We even got into that. Uh, oh. It was really important to really take it apart and yeah. go through and, and understand to take time to take it apart. And that was a typical Bible class. And then the next week we'd pick up where we left off. And it was delightful because a lot of things came out that we hadn't thought about before. We used to do um, one verse at a time, like Margot with the, with the dictionary there too. And then say literally what that one verse said. You know, sometimes it could be like five words, but then also look at it as what it, what it means inside, like what is the parts inside of you that represent what it's saying. Like there's no room in the end. That would be like, there's no room in your heart, that kind of stuff. That was neat. Yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. I like that kind. How to read the Bible. Was Jesus really born of a virgin? Did Moses actually part the Red Sea? Did God literally form Adam from the dust of the earth and breathe the breath of life into his nostrils, making him a living being? Intuitively, we know that something about these stories is true. We can feel it the way a blind person can sense the spaciousness of the sky. But though we know the stories are real, we falter when asked whether they are true, because we know that what is usually meant by the word true is not the same as what we understand in our heart. Deep spiritual truths cannot be understood intellectually. They must be experienced. They must dawn upon the human mind the way the sun dawns upon the land. They must arise within us in such a way that we feel them, not as ideas, but as direct perceptions of our own inner nature. This is why the Bible was written in story form rather than attempt to explain the truth, which cannot be done, the writers revealed their innermost thoughts the way the morning light reveals the details of the world before us, through impressions and subtle shadings, gradually filling in with color and vibrancy. The wholeness of the great creative being we call God emerges in our awareness as a full immersion awakening. We breathe it, we sense it, we are in it, and it is in us. We are inextricably a part of the oneness of creation. You know, I'm just going to interject here that it's it's interesting when we talk about uh, about what's what's true. When we read a story like a, a great a great piece of literature, we often find that it's it can be, even though it's a, a work of fiction it can be truer than actual life itself. Because especially in a great work of literary art, what it does is it takes and distills the combined experience of the human race. It distills it into one story, into one person or into one group of people. So what we're getting is like a, a hyper human beings we're, we're getting the the uh representation of what we all are so in that way the bible can be can be true without being factual it can be true without having to to take it literally and this isn't to say that anything in you know the stories in the bible didn't actually take place but i think that if we emphasize that, if we, if we put all the emphasis on, on the literal interpretation of these stories, then we miss out on something even better, which is the truth. Not the fact, not the history, but the truth. And the truth is something so overarching and so all-encompassing that everyone and anyone can identify with it. So I just wanted I like to- that term, Michael overarching yes right. it was so expansive yeah such was the vision of those who wrote the bible and they communicated it to us by embedding what they saw into the stories of our everyday life 
As you seek to understand the Bible, try to set aside what you have read or heard about this great mystical treatise. Read it with new eyes, the eyes of a mystic. There are keys to understanding sacred texts, symbols, which when known will unlock the mysteries of these ancient teachings and prepare you for spiritual initiation and the influx of the Holy Spirit. Creator, elevate my consciousness now so that I may know the truth of my being and that I may understand your creation as it really is. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm giving here a recommended reading, Esoteric Christianity by Annie Besant. Has anyone read that? I highly recommend it. Christy, you have? Yeah, I have it. It's really quite something. Who was she, Michael? I've heard her name, but... Um, Annie Besant was an amazing... She's obviously a mystic. Yes. Yeah, she, uh, she was an amazing woman, uh, a true polymath, a great intellectual and a very advanced teacher. If I get my history right, she and, and uh, um, Madame Blavatsky, mm -hmm. along with a couple of other guys, uh, started the Theosophy, the Theosophical Society. And uh, Besant, I believe, read, uh, wrote quite a few volumes. She divides Christianity into three sections, the historical, the mythical, and then the mystical. The last section helped me to understand St. Paul better than just about anything else. Because she speaks of it in terms of the ancient mystery schools. Okay, so. Michael, yeah. are those, those, I, those, that list on the, le on the right side of the screen look like a blog, blog entries? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is, yeah, it, me, is it your blog or who's the blog? Yeah, yeah, the Mystical Christ is my blog. Wow, Absolutely. I'm gonna have to follow your blog. Yeah, I was looking at some of those topics. Yeah, here are some of the uh, uh, the pages uh, in a WordPress uh, blog, which is what I have here. There are articles and then there are pages, and the pages are kind of in a in a permanent position, and the blog posts themselves. Uh, run chronologically, but this is like a table of contents for, for other articles. And this is on the uh, Holy Order website? Uh, no, this is, uh, course, on this the is uh, mysticalchrist.org. Yeah, and it's got, uh, it has other features too, like, uh, like here I've got uh, movies. Oh, cool. So I've taken... Uh -oh some movies that I really found to be symbolically significant and written up explanations. This one is my favorite, one of my favorites. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Snow White and the Huntsman. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just jam packed with Jungian psychology. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the Minority Report is, uh, is fabulous too. And of course, the Matrix. The Matrix is like, you know, the mother load of symbolic content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so, Michael, what Jean was asking you is this on the New Holy Order of Man's website, which it is. It's. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Down in the left hand corner, home H O O M blogs and websites, and it's listed there. So you can't get to it from, you know, or forget it or whatever. You can always find it on the website. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. And here's a here's the most uh, recent article. So, enough uh, free advertising there. I'll, uh... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you bet. So, I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a lot to um, uh, interpreting the Bible. Many people have been doing it for for centuries and centuries. And, and I think to me, the very worst thing that we can do is, is to um, just blanketly accept a, a set, set of interpretations that we really need to, to go in and look at them. And, and the way that you were describing earlier, uh, as far as taking a, 
you know, the Bible a verse at a time and, and really diving into it. Um, that's really good. And that's almost like a prerequisite for anything else. You have to kind of, you know, take it line by line like that. But what I find really interesting also is to look at the paragraphs and try to determine where the, where the paragraphs are and what general topics are being covered by which verses and how one paragraph leads into another uh, revealing a larger theme. And that's not always easy to do, especially in something like the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but, but when you do, when, like, like with the Sermon on the Mount, when you discover the, um, the blocks, so to speak, the, you know, the, the blocks of the text, how, how one set of ideas moves into another, and how several verses will all pertain to each other, it's really quite thrilling to get that kind of insight into the teaching. I mean, it, it really starts to make a lot of sense. Great. Is it right, Mike? Am I remembering right, Michael, that the original Greek doesn't really have divisions into paragraphs and verses? It's, it's just sort of this continuous, uh, you know, sentence after sentence. And it, it Somewhere along the line, someone later introduced what we recognize as chapter and verse and broke it up that way, yeah. um, which required making some judgments, some discernments. Yes, yes. I, I don't know about that, Paul. You're probably right. I, I, I think I remember hearing that somewhere. And I, you know, I suppose it, it, my overall approach to interpreting scriptures of any kind, whether it's the Bible or the Tao Te Ching or um, the Bhagavad Gita, any, any the Vedas, any, any text that you can come up with that's, and, and you know, the ones that really qualify are the ones that have lasted over time, you know, the enduring faiths of the world. But my, my approach has always been to to rise up in consciousness first, get as high as you can, and then look. Because if you if you try to if you try to go up that stairwell of interpretation, if you try to understand the Bible through the interpretations of others, it, you're going to find that there are so many dead bodies in that stairwell that you, you're, it'll take you forever to get to the top floor. I found that when we would uh, early, oh, about 15 years ago, we would, when we do Bible classes, I would have a copy of the New Jerusalem Bible next to it. Mm, yeah. Next to the King James Version. So we would go through it and we would compare. Yes. And you could see an actual direction a movement towards a certain preconception that the New Jerusalem Bible had that I didn't see as much in the King James. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, it was you know, fascinating. We love doing that. In fact, I think you uh, may have attended. I was going to ask you of all, given that there are many, many, many translations into English of the Bible, why you like the King James version in particular? Well, in the order that Margot and I were trained in. Uh, we pretty much got the, the King James Version intravenously. <laughs> but when I brought up the, the, the New Jerusalem Bible, which had been given to me many, many years ago, and so I, and so I went through several classes over, you know, because I, I would have communion, and then the, until noon after communion, we would have a class. And so we've done the Tree of Life and this. That made a whole, it actually had a spin yeah. It was quite intriguing. Now, we're talking 15 years ago, so I don't remember, but it was so, comparing the sentences, it was so obvious that um, you had to have a mediator like a priest in the, in the King James, in the um, New Jerusalem Bible. They, there was just this insertion of, you can have direct contact. Yeah, I, I find sometimes that uh, the somebody's current current interpretation actually can have can be really good and get you know shed light on part of 
of the passage that that uh, I didn't realize before. Yeah. So, so it's fun to do that because I mean, what? Because I did it with a group. So then we would talk about it, and then we did it for months because we had, a, and it was just great fun. You know, like what are they saying? You know, and the letters, Paul's letters. That was great. That was very enlightening to see. Well, what were they saying here, and what are they saying there? What do you think? And great discussions to have those two. Yeah. There, you know, one one passage that comes to mind. Uh, that's been really mangled, uh, I think, because mm -hmm. uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the mm -hmm. earth. And uh, this is where the Greek comes in, Polly, which, which you're mentioning. Um, I just uh, uh, learned a, uh, a different interpretation of the word meek, and the person who did it, uh, I guess, you know, really delved into it. He, he was qualified to do so. And he found that uh, what it actually means is that is to be meek is to have a weapon like a sword and be competent in its use, be good at using a sword and yet keeping it sheathed. Mm. Mm. That's a very specialized meaning, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, on top of that meaning, you know, on, on that definition, I would add, uh, or, you know, just reduce it to one word, which would be disciplined. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps self-restraint. Mm -hmm. To be, to have, uh, to have the physical advantage or to, or to be able to take somebody out and not do that. That's enormous strength. Right. Because to me, I don't know how it is for you, but when I read, you know, Blessed Are the Meek and how some people interpret that, they don't actually. Right. So it, they take it very literally. Yeah. Yeah. A as though being a doormat will get you into heaven, <laughs> which it will not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the code, it won't the code get you into heaven. Yes, the code of the samurai is if you unsheathed your sword, you would have to use it. Right. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Didn't do that. But once that thing is out, it has to it has to draw blood. Yeah. They were, yeah. So they were okay. like, would not. Mm -hmm. They yeah. would not um, unless it was really, and they would not if they were angry. We've talked about in the past at another class, Michael, that if a samurai was angry, he would walk away because it was impersonal. If he was working for a warlord and he was there for a particular reason. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you couldn't draw the sword. If you, you, and displaying them on sheathed, you always displayed them sheathed. Yeah, yeah. So, so Michael, it makes, it makes me think of uh, Neil Douglas Klotz. Uh, with his Aramaic translations of the of the uh, Beatitudes, and I'm thinking of the one that is "Blessed is the poor of spirit," mm -hmm. and which also people don't understand. It's like, what does that even mean? But he talks about it like like Aramaic is so poetic, like it has multiple meanings for each one of the words. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how spirit also means breath, and so if you're poor. And if you're poor, and poor can mean gentle. So if you are a person with a gentle breath, then you, I don't know what the rest of it is, inherit the earth or something. Um, but yeah. Uh, the, you, you, uh, get that's the, what it the makes kingdom me think of, of as yeah. another example. God, Susan, Susan, you just, it, just a light bulb went off in your, in your description. You know what it could also mean? What? It could mean uh, don't don't talk too much. <laughs> or, or in spirit could be do a lot of listening and yeah. just yeah yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really good, Michael. <laughs> Isn't that great? That is so great. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, because in the in that paper that I did on on the uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, that was that's how I interpreted it, but not quite as direct as that. 
um, mm. was that to be receptive, you know, I could mm. imagine Jesus saying to his, to his disciples, his prospective students saying, look, you're not here to teach me, you know, I'm not here to learn from you. You're here to learn from me. Mm. So, mm. so really what he's saying is just shut the hell up and listen. <laughs> because <laughs> you know how it is i mean especially with you know especially with young guys you know especially mm. young guys are just insufferable just absolutely insufferable because <laughs> we think we know everything you know and we yeah. want to tell the world and and that can be just an enormous annoyance to to a master teacher who's trying to train somebody i mean you know how how many years is the per is he going to have to put up with that before the before the kid actually becomes receptive and can actually hear what the teacher is saying? So, yeah, I think I think we just nailed it, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That is really <laughs> shut the hell up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, there's that uh, that uh, story that Master Subramunia of uh, uh you, you know you know who he, who he is the the american hindu master he, he died in 2001 um he said that when he went to to sri lanka i think it was or salon i forget which he uh, uh his teacher put him on silence for the first two years he couldn't even ask a question not mm -hmm. even a question not one question he showed up and his job was to do exactly what he was told. And that was it. Can you imagine? Wax on, today? wax off. Wax on, yeah, wax off. Right. Yeah, remember, yeah, remember that kid, that Ralph Macchio? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, great. A great movie. You remember how mouthy he was? <laughs> At the beginning. <laughs> yeah, he says, well, Mr. Miyagi, what am I, what are you doing? You just make me watch all stars. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to hear something in, do you want to hear something interesting that i just looked up sure i got my little greek new testament here and um the chapter matthew 5 5 blessed are the meek and the word that gets translated meek if you flip to the dictionary in the back um i mean it's obviously used in other places in the new testament but the the general definition is gentle or humble. Mm -hmm. And we talked before about humility as an incredible source of power. Yes. Um, which is very different from meekness, actually. I mean, at least the English connotation of humble versus meek. Mm -hmm. uh, I get different, different things out of it. But yeah. I've never seen that verse translated as blessed are the humble. Mm. Right, right. Interesting. It, well, it, it, it goes along with that, that meek in that, um, you know, what gives you an advantage in a situation? You come mm. into a compl complicated or tense or dicey situation. What gives you the advantage is you, you don't say anything. You don't speak first. You listen. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta figure you, out what's going on. You gotta I mean, figure out what's going on, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you could, you know, come up on the short end real fast. So that it's kind of like in chess, the way they say, "I'm not a chess player." Don't uh, so take it with a grain of salt. But they say to um, uh, to control the 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 edges of the board, not the middle. If you control the edge of the board. You have a hmm. distinct advantage. And that's like standing away from the action. Mm -hmm. You know, you stand away, you step back and you take a look and you observe, you know, it's like stand up, assess, assess, and then act. That's, that's a powerful it's, strategy. It's standing away from the action in the midst of it. Well, yeah, it's. But it, I don't it, mean. Phys I mean, you can be physically in the midst, but you can be. Yes. Right. Away. Yes. Because yeah. it's not personal to you. You're being. So then now you have all the ability to get all the information you need about it because it's right. not. Thing, it has nothing to do with you. Yes. So you stand away from it in its midst. And and that is a very powerful approach. I mean, that gives you the upper hand. Anybody in any situation. 
to to be observant and figure it out first. It, it's like you know, some people say to never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. <laughs> in, in certain situations. In certain situations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it never made any sense to me at all. And, and a lot of most people, I think, in the world, especially atheists, will take a look at that one passage and say, mm -hmm. you know, that's ridiculous. This whole, th therefore, the whole teaching, this whole idea of Jesus Christ is, is just, you know, ludicrous because nobody gets ahead in life by being meek. And that's actually true if you think that meek is being a doormat. Or as my, as my one time brother-in-law who was a car salesman said, uh, a lay down. <laughs> 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 that's what they'd call certain customers. You know, that's the customer who pays the sticker price. Oh. A lay down. <laughs> Not a very powerful position to be in. Yeah. Susan, if I write this, if this goes into another book, I'm I'm giving you the credit. <laughs> that is so great. I'm just so blown well, away. It was by you, that. Michael. It was you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael. Yes. I had a question. Actually, a question that I do not know the answer to. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, meek. The word meek. Yeah. Does have a very clear understanding an interpretation um, for those of us, myself, that mm -hmm. use the word. Presumably, the scholars that um, King James had create the King James Bible also were familiar with the word meek. Mm -hmm. um, from what I'm hearing now, meek seems to be a poor choice of a word from our understanding of what's meant by that beatitude. Why do you think the scholars or the people that wrote the King James chose that word. This is just strictly a guess, Patrick, but I, I would think that perhaps it had, uh, you know, a different meaning then or a deeper yeah. meaning. Yeah. And that, that kind of our understanding of it, because who, we never, we never use that word. The only time I ever use it is when I'm talking about, you know, that, verse in the Bible. I, I rarely ever, I never hear it in, in the media. It's not a compliment. <laughs> no, definitely not a compliment, right. But you're right. I mean, 500 years ago, or I forget when the King James Version was written, but quite a while ago, it might well have had different, a different connotation in English yeah. than it does now. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> and my, se my sense was that I thought that possibly it had some political connotation. Um, <laughs> and this perhaps is an expression of my cynicism that um, people that read it perhaps may feel by remaining meek uh, under the poli political system that was in place at the time, um, they might be able to rather than create rebellion, they might be able to, as it says, inherit heaven. Yeah. I, I pulled up the definition and similar does come up quiet. It's got patient, long suffering, forbearing, resigned, gentle, gentle and quiet. Quiet. So yeah. the quiet will inherit the earth. Yeah. That works. Patrick, to me, you know, this, this is a really good example of, of rising up in consciousness first and then looking at the, at the verse. And the way I, in, the way I interpret that is that, um, like, like looking at the, you know, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth makes no sense if we take the word meek in the, in the current usage of the word, it just doesn't make sense. So, so it's you kind of have to re, uh, reverse engineer it and say who does inherit the earth, you know, and 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 even in that phrase too, inherit the earth. What it, you know, there's a couple of different levels of meaning to that, but just in even in terms of of victory or uh, you know sovereignty or or any any kind of uh, anything like that, uh, it. 
it doesn't make sense unless you have to you have to look at that how do how do people actually inherit the earth and it's by being smart and by not showing your hand and by you know being strategic in your thinking being which, wise in it which means you have to you have to understand what's going on in order to even even develop a strategy so it's like keep your mouth shut listen you know don't it's like in the you know the godfather you know never tell anybody what what the family is thinking <laughs> you know never tell anybody what you're thinking and don't and don't give away the family business you know am i the only one here that knows every single line in the godfather <laughs> No, we watch it often at our house. <laughs> <laughs> but you, do you see my point, uh, yeah. Patrick? I, I think that's because that's what that's what actually works. That's kind of like the way we were talking about in the in the beginning, how a, a novel can actually be truer than real life, because it's the distillation of life. So if we look at this term, and you know, if we look at the Bible, and we and we look at it in from that standpoint we can ask ourselves you know what actually works and then look from that look at the bible and say is that is that what it's saying and and oftentimes it, it does it does reveal itself the the only thing that i would pause about is the the choice of the word inherent now when you inherit something some act has occurred such as a death now, mm -hmm. if in fact the inheritance perhaps refers to the second coming of Christ, then perhaps Christ or, or God would reward those who have been truly meek based on our understanding. If in fact there was, uh, <laughs> I'm going off into. No, that's okay. Um, Let's see, I, for, I forgot who it was that wrote that um, uh, that um, vodka was the opiate of the, um, the people in Russia. It kept them quiet. Mm. It kept them um, less so after the revolution, during Stalin's time, during yeah. the reign of terror in Stalin. But mm. it, it kept them from speaking out, from seeking some sort of opportunity to regress the, um, the problems. Um, during the feudal era of um, England and in you know, Europe, uh, the, at least based on the perspective that we have, there seems to be a lot that people could object to. And my concern, and it was a concern, was that this was written in a way to keep people quiet, mm -hmm. keep people from raising alarm. Right. That that after the second coming, that you'll get it. Don't worry about it now. Wait until then. Yeah. Be meek now. Don't object. Um. Okay, I would, my, my plan was just to listen. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm glad you brought that up because I think you're, you're right on about that. And, but I, I think that it really, that's the way they used it, you know. And, and in those days, uh, I forget when the middle class actually started arising, but uh, I'm pretty sure back then it, it didn't exist. And you had basically two classes of, of, of people, you know, the very, very rich and the very, very poor. And so, uh, you know, it was even, I think the, the person who, who translated the Bible into English was burned at the stake for precisely that reason, because they didn't want people interpreting the Bible for, them, for themselves, because it would just create chaos. They didn't want it in the vernacular, and, but they had the three classes, because we had the royals, and then we had the merchants, and then we had the serfs. Yeah, yeah. I was looking through some references and stuff. So poor in spirit opens, this falls into what you're saying, open to God's teaching and humble. So again, like to me, that means quiet and listening, not yeah. 
you know, being just really open to it. Yeah, because what is this? You know, I mean, what is this teaching we call the Sermon on the Mount? And and I I'm really convinced that it is Jesus uh, vetting prospective students, and he's not. Uh, this is not just for the general public. This isn't like uh, mm -hmm. the the laws for a, for a truly great social order, you mm -hmm. know, because it simply isn't. We don't have the you know the Platonic uh, ruling class, or shouldn't that uh, you know the, the Plato talked about. He said that we should pick the very smartest people, and and they should naturally rule over us, and we should and we should just do what they say. You know, that's not the that's not the recipe for a democracy, or or, or even a representative democracy. So. So this is really specifically for a master teacher uh, telling his students or her students uh, what's expected of them. This, he's, he's vetting them. He's saying he's, he wants to weed out you know, the, uh, the people who are there just to expound on what they know, you know and convince him how smart they are. And, and to look good in front of all the other students and, and to the teacher and thinking that he's going to be ushered to the head of the class because he's so smart and, and, and so worthy. You know, that's, that's the very mm. last student that a teacher wants because it takes so long to wear that down. And, and so very often it, it never wears down and they just wind up uh, having to kick them out you know, of the ashram or the monastery or, or you know, the, the school. Mm. So, I have and, to say and, This has been a wonderful class. Thank oh, you okay. so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs> God bless. Bye. Bye. I got to go too. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> have a good night. Thank you. You bet. So this, this, this also shows up really dramatically in, in an apprenticeship program where, uh, you know the uh, the the uh, the apprentices. They have to. The, the the saying goes something like this. It says, "the the journeyman will will tell the apprentices, first do it my way. Then you can make your adaptations. Don't don't get innovative. Don't don't try to figure this out. I've already figured it out." And I'm going to give to you the distillation of what I have figured out. And I want you to learn that and only that. And then when you, on the other side of that, then you can bring in your ideas, not until then. That's the straight up traditional journeyman apprentice model. So and and it's pretty it pretty much uh, you know is is timeless in its application, but we're 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 actually moving into a different stage now because everybody is has advanced so far that you know most of the things discussed in in spiritual teachings a lot of people have already gotten that under their belt, and so now it's a whole new it's kind of a whole new ball game and that kind of top down teaching it doesn't really work anymore it just gets too much resistance and i think that's partly because you know we're coming into the aquarian age and if anybody knows any aquarian you know what i'm talking about right <laughs> you can't tell them anything, anything. <laughs> <laughs> So they're 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 like the rebels, you know, rebel without a cause. <laughs> so we have to, you know, we have to take that that into consideration. And and I like it much much better. I mean, it's it's so much more of a collaborative approach to the teachings. So, but it's a it's an entirely different different model. It still requires you know listening, and and you know speaking less and listening more. And all of that, but um, but it's a lot easier, you know. It's a much much more, and it's more respectful too, I think, because uh, most people have been through a lot, and and they they have what they know, and and you don't want people to throw that out, you know. It's like you know that saying: keep an open brain, open mind, but don't let your brains fall out. <laughs> the the. Yeah. The encounter with spiritual truth can be so devastating 
in a good way. <laughs> it can be so, it can so obliterate your sense of self that the tendency is to, is to then throw out everything you thought you knew, you knew, even the good stuff, you know, it's like, uh, you could be the most, uh, a most amazing computer programmer alive and go through, a, if you went through that process, that, that deduction, you would then think, well, I can't be a computer programmer anymore. Now I'm on the spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And no, no, what, what you want to, you want to be able to, to, uh, to bring all of your tools forward into your spiritual work. Mm -hmm. You have to set them aside temporarily, usually. You know, in, in, the, in the original order, when people came in, we used the term, put it on the shelf. Mm. That if you've, if you've got a question or something doesn't seem to, it doesn't click or, or you don't like it or something, don't make a decision about it right away. Just put it on the shelf. Because as your consciousness rises and expands, then it will make sense later on. And again, that's, that's like being meek or being humble, being quiet. You, you know, you're not going to make an issue of it. And, and that's, that's really important, especially in meditation, because you can get the wildest things in meditation and think, well, that's just crazy. And, but write it down and put it on the shelf. And then next time you look at it, it may, it may look like something you never saw before. So, so all of these all of these sayings have their external application, but the the real truth of them is in internal. You know, it's like where, you know, of all places, where would it be the most the wisest to to keep your mouth shut and and listen as hard as you can, and that would be when you're when you're going within and asking self for the solution or the answer to a problem. You know, you want to, you want to, because you know how sneaky the mind is. The mind can, you can say, yeah, I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. But, but it, it's listening for what? <laughs> it's listening for something that'll, that'll validate what it already knows. <laughs> and that's all at once. And that's all it hears. You know, we, we hear what we want to hear. And, and this, is, this is like a very deep dive into that phenomenon and saying, master your mind to the, to the extent where you can truly put it into a receptive mode mm -hmm. where you're actually listening and not just listening for something. That's really hard. It's really hard, believe me. But that's, and that's, that's like, that's the thing... Uh, written in blood over the doorpost, right? At the entrance to the school, it's blessed are the, the poor in spirit, the poor in breath. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's risky. You know, it's risky interpreting these things because these are the core <laughs> teachings. You know, these are the core yeah. teachings. And and uh well, it's, you know that when when neil douglas klotz talks about these things he he says that the you know like our king james version of jesus's words and you know like this they might not be inaccurate he he calls them incomplete mm. because mm. there's poetry there mm. that if you just take the surface meaning you're missing all the poetry mm. Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> you don't. Oh, say something about why you don't like that. I'm, I'm um, curious to know. Well, because I've seen, you know, I've I've researched, you know, especially the sermon uh, so much that I, and most of what I find is just ways to get around the fact that they don't understand what it means at all. Mm. You know, that they just, they can't, they can't quite put their hands on it. So they're going to, they're going to, moderate it in some way well, who, or who's who's the they that you're referring to the scholars and theologians oh the writers like the, yeah. the, the interpreters and the translators mm -hmm. and like that like that yeah like yeah. they read something and they go well i can't mean that let's yeah. see let's maybe let's see something yeah, the else. harvard yeah. and yale divinity schools you know those kinds of those kind, they're coming they're 
they're coming at it from an intellectual standpoint and they think that they can figure it out you know mm. within the text and the and the the method there is to compare it you know it, to com, uh, compare and contrast with what else has been written but it, it always oh. has to do with the canon or the accepted mm -hmm. interpretations and if it mm -hmm. if they can't shoehorn it into that then they wiggle around it or they they try to soften mm -hmm. it or put a gloss over it or call it poetic you know and i'm and i i i find it very poetic myself but i, I also find it um razor sharp mm. yeah, and i mm. i think that you know we have mm. to we have to assume that this is the way i look at you know especially the sermon on the mount is probably one of the finest most advanced most evolved set of teachings ever like ever i mean you know the other religions too have their gems but but this is like i think it's the best that has ever happened <laughs> And it's so deep, so intricately layered, and in, in, but but at the same time, so simple. Sometimes I think about how amazing it would have been to have been there, yeah, to to hear the master's like the Lord's prayer, for the master to to give the Lord the words to the Lord's prayer for the very first time to be in the audience when that was occurring yeah that would have been amazing for those people yeah uh, vibration yeah comes out that is just mm. power moving that goes through all their cells and every one of those phrases it. you know just would be mm. if you if you were hearing that for the very first time if you were among the people that were in on the very first people on the planet ever hearing those words every single one of those phrases would have just rocked your world yeah, yeah there's there are two basic uh kinds of a, a, a approaches to the spiritual path one's the charismatic and the other is the contemplative and what you're talking about susan there is the charismatic where you're really you you get the full impact of it and it just mm -hmm. fills you and it and, it, and uh, lifts you up, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, there is a way to hear those words, but they have to come out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the idea then is to, again, to get as high in consciousness as you can and really connect with the master and then pray, let him pray through you. Um, yeah. I like you're like you're 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 uh, creating your own personal Lord's prayer in that moment. Yes. That, with that having ha established that connection, that's beautiful. Yeah. 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 I, I believe that's the essence of the charismatic path. There was an exercise that uh, we did a few years ago. Um, it was uh, forget what it was called, but we walked. It, we were in the forest and we were walking and there was a, a person kind of directing us as we were walking and he would say, okay, now walk as Jesus, mm -hmm. which was in, it was inviting Jesus into yourself and, and experiencing him in your body walking. And we would do that for a while. And then, then he would say, okay, now walk as Mary. And then we would do that. And it was, it was a, a memorable experience. I mean, it, it was so charismatic that it was just extraordinary. It is, 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 yes. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that is what happens as we're doing this, is it really is coming forth from within us. When I was in the Brotherhood, we as students started doing Bible study with each other to learn how to do it. And the first time <clears throat> I sat there and started it, I just saw the whole thing. Just what was I was saying as a, and what it meant and unfolded. Like I was reading, you know, the reality of it because it was, you know, it was visual. It was palpable. Oh. And so I didn't have to try and interpret it. You know, it was telling me what it meant. 
And then I was saying that to the rest of the class. Yeah. And it was like, you know, it's a lie. Yeah. And w what you said, you have to get up in the consciousness to really experience that. Yeah. You know, I think Buddha had this down too. He, I think he understood that fundamental dichotomy of, of either charismatic or, which is the upwelling experience of God within you. Uh, he didn't use those words, of course, but th there's that, but then there is the contemplative. And he said, walk the middle path. Don't be all one and none of the other, because if you're all one, you're going to, you're going to be so detached from the earth. You're going to, you're going to, walk into a tree or into a ditch and if, but if you're all contemplative if you're all always analyzing and thinking and trying to you know draw patterns uh then you're going to lose the experience altogether so the really we have to have both hands in, at work here you know the the charismatic and the and the contemplative we have to we have to go for the experience but then we have to think about it what did what happened just then what was what was that experience and by doing that then we integrate it and then we also we think how am i going to integrate this into my life how am i going to live this how am i going to walk the walk the talk see that that's 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 the incarnation that's the keystone of the whole christian message is the incarnation that's letting God live in you as you live in the world. That's like the, the whole, you know, uh, Merchant Sam, uh, uh, Samuel Lewis, the, uh, uh, the Sufi, he was talking uh, about how so many clergymen would come up to him and, and talking about their particular church or religion saying, we have a pipeline to God. And he says, that's great. I have a pipeline from God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's it. That's that's it. That's it. That's it. The incarnation is 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 living, letting God live through you as you live into the world. That was that was just great, Michael. Really. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. I mean Thank you. Well, everything so simple and clear. This is it. Well, it wouldn't even be possible to talk about these things if you guys weren't at the level that makes it possible, you know? I mean, it's, 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 it's almost impossible to just take anyone and talk about these things because there's nowhere, nowhere for that plane to land, you know? <laughs> yeah, we face that all the time, don't we? You know, yeah. you, you want to talk to somebody, explain something in there. Yeah. <sighs> well, there, there, you know, it comes right back around to blessed are the, are the poor in spirit. It's it's like when you the first thing you need to do when you're talking to somebody is find out where they're at. Yeah. You can't do that if your mouth's open and you're talking. Yeah, yeah. I just had this whole conversation in two weeks. This uh, guy, he he's my trainer. I'm his chiropractor. He'd come and and he talked about um, years and years ago. He's probably 38, maybe somewhere. But he was uh, living in Dubai and, you know, had everything he thought he wanted. He was engaged, you know, a big house, lots of money, lots of cars. And all of a sudden it went empty as anything. There was nothing inside of him. And he had to turn around and come back. And he started reading, you know, Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita and the Bible and all of these things to synthesize them into what he thought. And so we had this conversation about, well, you know, God is alive and, you know, it is your consciousness or God. And he's going, well, you know, well, well, because it was very hard for him, you know, to have done all he did and not be what he thought it really was. Yeah. And then he was in today, complete shift. Hmm. You know, he wanted to know what I had to say about this. He wasn't arguing or pushing his, you know, what he thought anymore. It was like, yeah. okay, maybe there really is something deeper here. Yeah. It was two conversations. That's know? so great. Somebody That's so when great. they're open, because the vibe goes in and it resonates inside their heart. 
Yeah. And I had a real heart experience, you know. My heart opened up, his heart opened up, and it flowed and went, okay, there is something deep here. Yeah. It was, you know, yeah. powerful. Yeah, that's, that's where the, you know, that's what the teacher wants in a student. And when a, yeah. when a person shows up with an empty cup like mm -hmm. that, then, boy, they're, they're ushered right in, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So that that's really great. He he really came to uh, to a very humble inner position. Yeah. 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 Well, um, Jean, would you like to close us with a prayer? Certainly. Oh, most heavenly Father, Mother, God. We come unto thee this evening with open hearts and open minds, and you have filled us. And we are thankful for these teachings and this guidance that leads us in our lives to teach your people to give unto them all the life that you have shown us. We are thy students. And we are thankful for thy love and guidance in all things. And we serve thee every day in every way. And we thank thee through thy Son, our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Jean. Well, that, uh, great class. That was, that was really good. Um, Thank you, Michael. Be sure yeah. to check out mysticalchrist.org. Okay. And, and subscribe right. to my YouTube channel. <laughs> guys, next week. We want to spread the word. Bye. Bye. Have a Bye. good night. Bye. Bye, Patrick.